Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. My name is David Dodick, and I'm a neurologist at the Mayo Clinic and fortunate to be chair of the American Brain Foundation's Board of Directors. I want to thank you very much for your support of the American Brain Foundation and for your generous donations, which make the kind of discovery, research, and innovation that you're going to hear about tonight possible. So the title of this evening's presentation is Research in Autism, uh, What's Giving Us Hope? And we're fortunate, very fortunate, to be joined tonight by Dr. Shafali Jeste. Dr. Jeste is a behavioral child neurologist specializing in autism and related neurodevelopmental disorders. She is an associate professor in psychiatry, neurology, and pediatrics at the UCLA David Geffen School of Medicine and a lead investigator within the UCLA Center for Autism Research and Treatment, or CART. <clears throat> After earning her undergraduate degree at Yale in 97 and her MD from Harvard Medical School, Dr. Jeste completed a residency in child neurology and a fellowship in behavioral child neurology at Children's Hospital in Boston. So she has quite an academic uh, pedigree. She has served on the board of the Child Neurology Foundation and received its Researcher in Training Award. She was also a recipient of the American Academy of Neurology's Clinical Research and Training Award and currently serves on the Academy's Science Committee. <clears throat> she was recently elected to the board of the International Society for Autism Research. And she is a board member of the American Brain Foundation and chair of our governance committee. Um, so hardly, I could hardly think of anyone better to talk about tonight's topic than Dr. Jeste. As always, if you have questions that strike you while she's speaking, please don't hesitate to type them into the chat box during the presentation, or you can save them and ask them uh, after Dr. Jeste's presentation. Dr. Jeste, Welcome, thank you so much for being here. Looking forward to your presentation. Thank you, David, and thank you to the ABF for inviting me and for actually welcoming me on the board. It's been an incredible few years of working with this um, amazing organization. And thank you for all of you who are joining. I see folks popping up and I'm guessing there's gonna be a lot of lively discussion at the end. Um, so um, what I'm gonna do is uh, talk to you for about you know 10 to 15 minutes just about autism, kind of where we are in the research landscape. And again, as, as David mentioned, really where the hope lies, because we really are in this incredible era right now of discovery and innovation and, and hope for therapeutics actually in autism. Um, so I'll talk for a while and then I'm happy to answer questions um, as they arise. Um, so just to get us all kind of on the same page, what is autism? So autism spectrum disorder, ASD, we call it, I'm just gonna call it autism for ease of um, talking about it, is a neurodevelopmental disorder, which means it's a condition that affects early development. Um, other examples of neurodevelopmental disorders are global developmental delay, which is when a child has um, delays in speech and motor and other areas, um, intellectual disability, which affects cognitive function, ADHD is also considered a neurodevelopmental diagnosis or disorder. Um, so autism as at its core is a condition that's defined by having challenges or impairments or deficits, whichever term you wanna use in social behaviors, in social communication skills. So the way that a person, either a child or, a, or an adult really interacts with others and, and um, sort of exhibits those sort of, sort of social behaviors. The other side to the autism diagnosis, the other element of it is the presence of restricted interests or repetitive behaviors. So children or adults with autism tend to have rigidity in the kinds of things they might be, um, interact with or be interested in. Um, in that domain also is um, a new actually part of the diagnosis, which is actually having challenges in sensory processing. So individuals with autism might be really um, overly sensitive or undersensitive to sensory inputs like sounds or touch or light or things like that. Um, so again, it's a constellation of different behaviors and developmental features uh, that we diagnose based on the way a child or adult presents, right? So it's a behavioral diagnosis based on a list of symptoms. So what's happened over the years is that we've become very proficient in diagnosing autism. We understand it better. We're really aware of subtle features that we might see even in early childhood and infancy. And we've become very proficient at diagnosing. 
And when I was in residency back at Boston Children's, you know, we were at this like surge point where we were diagnosing kids with autism right and left, not necessarily just kids who had only autism. They might've had other neurological issues like epilepsy or um, genetic syndromes and things like that. And we were very proficient with the diagnosis. Where we failed though back then was to provide parents with guidance on the next steps. So we make a really accurate behavioral diagnosis based on those symptoms like social impairments and repetitive behaviors or restricted interests. But we struggle to give parents guidance on what would, what would come next, meaning what might we expect over the child's development? What are therapies that could be helpful to help improve outcomes or help mitigate some of the challenges that these children really faced? And so we often were, again, making these diagnoses and not giving parents a lot of hope for, for the future. And the reality often was that the therapies that we were able to recommend were really based on what was available. So the gold standard therapeutic for autism is behavioral intervention, interventions that target some of those core symptoms or deficits. Uh, but the behavioral interventions that we're able to provide or even recommend are often just what's available in the child's regional center or the area where they live or what might be available in the school. It may not be exactly what we think is the right intervention for that child. So not a lot of precision there, right? Sort of a general, we're making a good diagnosis and then really not providing great feedback about next steps. Um, and that's frustrating, I have to say, as a clinician, right? And we're physicians, we want to help our families, we want to give good diagnoses so that we can really guide parents on what the next steps are, you know, really help provide a clear path forward. Um, hopefully that path includes very precise and exact therapies. And that's kind of where we're moving now. So what's happened over the last 10 to 15 years is that the landscape has changed dramatically. And I would say now we're in this era of what I like to think of as precision health. And so what is precision health? So I can quote Obama actually in his State of the Union address, you know, five, six year, 2015, I think was when he um, uh, launched this initiative to really fund a lot of precision health programs through the NIH. And he defined precision health as providing the right treatment to the right patient every time. Um, I would add in neurodevelopmental disorders like autism, we also want to provide the right treatment to the right patient at the right time, ideally really early in development when we're first seeing these changes or differences unfold. Okay, so how have we gotten there? What are the advances that have really accelerated that goal to precision health? And the really big one, the first one is genetics. Okay, so we've had an explosion in our ability to examine the genetic underpinnings of many conditions in neurology, right? Not just autism or neurodevelopmental disorder. This cuts across all the different conditions that some of you have probably heard about in these salons, right? Um, and as we've been able to use techniques like chromosomal microarray or whole exome sequencing, the details don't matter. We've been able to identify changes in the DNA that we know are basically causative of the neurodevelopmental disabilities that we see like autism. And through those techniques, what we know is that about 15 to 20% of individuals with autism have a known genetic cause. Uh, and it could be, again, a single gene disorder. It could be what we call a copy number variant. So a constellation of genes that are affected that are all next to each other in a portion of the DNA. Um, it's not the same genetic cause for every person. So that's really important to understand. It's thousands of different genetic causes, right? But taken together accounts for about 15 to 20% of individuals on the autism spectrum. So why is that important? You might say, well, that sounds really academic. We know cause, why does that help? Well, here's the thing, when we start identifying cause, we can look back and figure out what's the mechanism? What is that gene actually doing? How is that gene affecting brain development? Uh, what are the pathways that are affected by this gene either being deleted or duplicated or just expressed differently? And as we uncover those mechanisms, we can start identifying and designing treatments that target the underlying cause or that target the pathway between the gene and eventually the, the uh, impact on the brain or the behavior, right? And that's really precision health, right? So we can start targeting those causes very, very early. 
And that's exactly what's happening in our field. So we now have a lot of clinical trials that are ongoing that are targeting specific causes of autism and other developmental disabilities. So just at UCLA alone, we have five clinical trials ongoing right now for different genetic syndromes associated with autism. Now, again, I always get asked the question, how does this apply to autism as a whole? It doesn't in the sense that it's not that one treatment will impact or help every single individual with autism. But we know that autism is a constellation of a lot of different underpinnings, right? It's a, it's a behavioral diagnosis. It's the common pathway you know, from a lot of different causes. And so if we can show that individual causes can be targeting targeted, that's gonna open the door for new therapeutics for other causes, right? And then we also know that there are some treatments that might work for multi multiple causes but at least we have the clinical trials now. And that was not the case even five years ago. Um, and if we have time later, I'm happy to talk about, because a lot of the research we do is in what I call clinical trial readiness, meaning how do we get ourselves ready so that when a therapeutic is developed, we can develop the trial that's gonna help us know if the drug is working. And that may sound really mundane, but it's actually pretty complicated. We have to figure out how do we enroll the right kiddos or adults in the trial? What are we measuring as the endpoint? What's the clinical outcome that we're trying to measure? How can we measure those things quickly if the trial is like two to three months, right? Um, how do we, you know, can we define biomarkers like brain-based biomarkers that tell us if the drug is hitting the target? So those are all the kinds of things that we're doing in our field, but it's all to get us ready for these clinical trials, which again is a really, really exciting opportunity. And I think it gives families a lot of hope that that's where we're moving. So that's one really exciting advance, right? But the other thing genetics has really taught us is when we look at all these different genetic causes, what we have learned is that brain development in autism is affected very, very early, even as early as in fetal brain development, right? So it's not that at age two or three, all of a sudden autism hits, right? We know that there's changes, they may be subtle in the way the brain fundamentally is wired. So I always think of it as like the brain circuit. So your brain is made up of millions and billions of neurons that all communicate, right? They all, through neurotransmitters and synapses, they communicate with each other and they, for, they, they form networks. And we know that in autism, those brain networks are just not forming the way that we see form, formed in typical development. Now, I wanna make an important point that our brain is constantly rewiring, right? Based on experience, based on behavior, based on the environment that we are living in. And so there's a lot of, we call plasticity, right? There's a lot of changes that are going on. And so it's not that these changes are static and that we can't actually you know, um, manifest some kind of modulation of these circuits. But what we know is that these circuits are affected really early. So you might ask, well, why is that important? Well, it, it's pushed us to really ask the question, well, can we measure those changes well before we would make a diagnosis? So can we even start to predict which babies might be at higher likelihood of developing autism or having an autism diagnosis? Because as you can imagine, like the behaviors I described in autism, those are behaviors that we're diagnosing usually in the second or third year of life, sometimes even later than that. But if we think that if we know that the brain changes are occurring even earlier, we should be able to measure those. And so there's many studies around the world uh, that are studying infants who are considered at higher likelihood of having autism. And you might ask, well, who are those infants? Well, the most common group being studied are what we call baby siblings. So these are babies who have older siblings with autism. Those babies have a higher likelihood of developing autism. The rate is about 15 to 20%. And there's actually an international research consortium called the BSRC, the Baby Sibs Research Consortium, which I'm actually chairing this year, that basically is set out to ask this question, can we identify really early signs of autism before we make a diagnosis? The other, the other group that we can study are kids who have known genetic syndromes. And many of those are ones that we see as neurologists. So syndromes like tuberous sclerosis complex or Duke 15Q syndrome, you know, syndromes that are often diagnosed at, at birth or even before based on findings on ultrasound and other things. And based on those, those um, based on knowing a child has a genetic diagnosis that confers a higher risk for autism, we can follow these infants really early and ask, can we predict? Or at least can we help, we think of it as stratifying, meaning can we select the kids that we're most worried about 
right? Because why, why does that help? We're going to be able to then monitor those kids more carefully and then ideally start interventions even before they're diagnosed, right? And those interventions could even be preventative. So that's really exciting. And I want to make the point that actually the work specifically in babies with tuberous sclerosis complex with the goal of identifying these early predictors, that was research that I did gosh, I'm dating myself now, but 12 years ago, it was my first grant and it was funded by the American Brain Foundation. So it was the Clinical Research Training Fellowship. It was right out of residency. You know, we had this idea, gosh, we should be following these babies very early on. So let's figure out how we can do that using measures of brain function like EEG, as well as looking at behavior. And that research has actually now led to the first clinical trial of behavioral intervention for infants with TSE with the goal of really improving developmental outcomes. Uh, so that's a really exciting area in our field too. And a lot of our clinical trials now are targeting even earlier development, right? So that we can ask, can we, mod can we modulate development to really improve outcomes? So those are two huge areas of excitement. And I put those both under the umbrella of precision health because we have therapies that are targeting specific cause and we now have ways to detect and even hopefully treat really, really early in development, right? At, a, at the most precise time possible before, you know, we're actually even making these diagnoses. So again, really, really exciting time. Um, in the last couple of minutes though, I do wanna highlight where our major gaps are still because we do have a lot of gaps and I'm telling you about the excitement of research. You know, those studies have not yet become clinical practice. It's not like we now are at a, stand, a point where we can identify a marker in the brain at two months of age and say, oh, we're gonna monitor your child more closely, right? For autism, because we're more worried. We're not quite there yet, right? So we have to bring those research studies and the insights that we have gained into the clinics. And that's gonna take some time. But there's other major gaps in our field. Um, one is access. So we are doing across the world a lot of really beautiful research trying to understand these under genetic underpinnings and designing treatments, but we still really struggle to make this work accessible to the broader community. There's a lot of disparities in our, not just research, but also our care, particularly in racial, um, ethnic and racial minorities, and particularly for those living in low-income areas. Because as you can imagine, it's not easy to come into a tertiary medical center to be involved with a study, right? We really, it's, it takes a lot of time and cost and effort, and that's difficult for many families. And so there's a lot of work now being done on figuring out how do we deliver research in a way that's more accessible? And actually COVID has helped us from that standpoint because we've learned that, hey, even though we're all sick of Zoom, Zoom works pretty well. And we can actually, if a family at least has access to internet and a phone or a computer, which again is not always the case, but if there's some access to that, then we can at least deliver maybe some of these opportunities remotely. And we're doing a lot of work in that area to try to figure out how to really improve access. The other major gap in our field, and this is one that as a pediatric neurologist, I actually you know, feel very heavily, and you might be surprised by that because I'm a pediatrician and a pediatric neurologist, is transition to adulthood and care for adults with autism. So we've done so much work with infants and young children and, you know, thinking more about timing of diagnosis and these early interventions, and that's all really important. But meanwhile, our children with autism are growing up into adults. And we have very few programs that are um, available from the standpoint of behavioral interventions, from the standpoint of clinical trials for treatments, and from the standpoint of even important ways to support healthy living from the standpoint of medical care, job placement, you know, social supports. Um, it, it feels like it's a big drop off. Um, and, you know, I, as a pediatric neurologist, I actually do take care of patients through a lifetime because I'm committed to my patients once I start, you know, caring for them. But I see the second school, they're done with school, which is at age 22 in certain areas. Um, there's a challenge there. You know, we don't know what to do, how to help our adults with autism, and we need more programs um, for those adults. And I think that's really, really critical. Um, and then I guess I'll just lastly end by saying that, you know, I get asked a lot about, you know, how did COVID affect individuals with autism and what did we learn? Um, we actually did an international survey asking parents and families of children and adults with autism and related neurodevelopmental disorders, what was the impact of COVID restrictions on your life? 
Um, and not surprisingly, what we found was that the majority of our families and our kids had lost access to healthcare. They lost access to services. You know, it's hard if you're a child with autism to gain that much from a Zoom occupational therapy session or a Zoom ABA, right? You really, really need that in-person um, exposure and contact and communication. And that just wasn't available. And so even though now restrictions are lifting and we're able to bring people back together in person, we're still really living the effects of over a year of a lot of our families not having access to the services that they need. Um, and I think that's just really important. It's a call to action for all of us as providers to continue to support our families. Um, but on the flip side, it did expose us to the opportunities around telehealth and the opportunities that are provided by us being able to con communicate with families remotely. It should not replace in-person contact. But if it's if the issue is it's either Zoom or nothing, well then let's at least use Zoom, right? Or, or whatever it is. Let's find a way to build networks remotely so that families feel connected to providers, families feel connected to each other. Um, and that's something we've learned a lot about during COVID. And I think that's been one of the few benefits of this incredibly challenging time for all of us actually, um, but particularly for our families of children and adults with autism. Um, so, you know, I've said a lot in 20 minutes, but I just, you know, really want to emphasize that again, I'm a clinician at first and foremost, and my goal in being committed to this field of autism research is that I want to do more than diagnose, right? I think that's great to give an accurate diagnosis, but it really doesn't mean a lot if you can't provide, if I can't provide a family with some guidance around the next steps about what their journey could look like. And I want to be a part of that journey. And some of that journey involves therapeutics. It may not for some, but we want to be able to at least provide families with guidance and some answers. And we're, we're actually now at a point where we can start doing that. And for me, that's what hope is, right? We provide our families with hope that at least we're trying, right? We're trying to go beyond just being astute diagnosticians. Um, and that hope for me is what drives me to do this work I do every day. I learn exquisitely from all the families. You know, if, if some of you on this call have children or adults with autism, you know, I mean, you're the reason that I do the work that I do and I learn from you. And the challenges you have or the needs you have are what we as researchers use to go back to the drawing board and figure out, okay, how do we answer that question, right? Or as a clinician, I go back to the drawing board and think, okay, well, how do I treat this issue? I need to figure out a better way to do this because I'm not doing it well enough right now. Um, and so I'm really grateful for that. That partnership with my patients has been, you know, really the cornerstone of everything that I as a clinician and a researcher really do. Um, and I can't thank the ABF enough because they kind of, you know, a lot of this early, early infancy work especially was initially funded by them. And it's led to this whole kind of research enterprise actually and some nice um, opportunities for um, further growth in that area. So. Um, with that, I'll stop. Um, we have, it looks like a good 25 to 35 minutes for questions. Um, and I'll take it from there, but thanks so much for inviting me. Shafali, that was excellent. Um, promising, exciting, hopeful, uh, but still a long way to go. So uh, that was really excellent. Um, please, anybody, if you have a question, please ask. I've got a lot, but I'm not going to uh, intrude if anybody has a question, but maybe just to start while people are thinking. Um, is there a genotype-phenotype correlation? Because you talked about some of the genetic underpinnings and you talked about how, well, you didn't talk about this, but there's a lot of heterogeneity. So, yeah. you know, if you've seen one kid with autism, you've seen one kid with autism. So is there a genotype-phenotype correlation? Great question. And, um, you know, I'm glad you quoted Lorna Wang, who is a, you know, very... Um, well-known autism clinician who said, if you've seen one child with autism, you've seen one child with autism. It is very heterogeneous because again, it's sort of a list of these behaviors and symptoms that could have a lot of different etiologies. So the simple, the quick answer is that what we know is that in these single gene um, mutations or copy number variants, so these, you know, these big genetic causes, as a whole, individuals who have those genetic causes tend to have um, more, more neurodevelopmental challenges. They're more likely to have intellectual disability, more likely to have comorbidities such as sleep issues or epilepsy, more likely to have motor impairments, 
Um, so they tend to be, I don't like saying more affected because I think that you know anyone who is challenged you know, and has a any of, of these diagnoses has challenges, you know, even if their IQ is high and they have all kinds of other skills, there's still things that are hard, right? So I don't want to undermine that, but um, definitely they tend to be on that end of the spectrum that often is associated with, you know, sort of intellectual disability and those sorts of things. Um, but there is no, within the various genetic causes, there is no, you know, perfect uh, genotype phenotype correlation at all. Um, there are definitely some trends. So certain conditions do have certain features that are more common, uh, but but not on a one-to-one -one basis at all. Yeah. It's a good question. I have a question. There is a question here. In the, I'm sorry, please go ahead. Certainly. My name is Colin Streetman. I'm a BCBA board certified behavior analyst. I'm here from full spectrum behavior analysis. Uh, we have a number of doctors who are conducting research currently on behavior interventions and in practice related to autism. Yeah. And I was especially keen on your presentation and the part that keyed on uh, adults with autism as underrepresented in terms of um, training opportunities and developmental opportunities. Now, of course, we know that's because the finances by many states are cut off when children reach adulthood. But I'm curious if you have any um, research that you can think of off the top of your head related to 21st century job training skills for those with neurodiversity. Great question. And I will say that there, I can, I'll tell you about one program at UCLA that's pretty amazing. Um, and we need many more like it. Um, so there, so there's a program that was developed by Liz Logason, who's a clinical psychologist and it's called PEERS, P-E-E-R-S. And it's a social skills training for individuals with autism. And it's actually was originally designed to target sort of the adolescent age group. Um, adolescents into adulthood. Um, there's also peers for preschoolers. There's a bunch of different social skills trainings. Um, and uh, so that was developed and now they actually have a peers to careers program. <laughs> and it's specifically around providing, um, you know, young adults with autism, some vocational training, because you're right, it's a huge issue. Um, that program is incredible. It's not enough. And we need more of that. I will tell you that, you know, I think that our funding organizations um, appreciate this gap. And if you, you know, it's just interesting, even in the last year, if we, if you look at sort of the request for applications, we call those RFAs that come out from the National Institutes of Health and our other big funding organizations, you know, many of those that are, that are um, uh, geared towards autism, very specifically state, you know, that one of the key areas that they would like addressed is autism in adulthood whether it be managing, you know, com comorbidities or co-occurring conditions or thinking about, like you're saying, you know, vocational training, job skills, those sorts of things. Um, so the other group in, around the country that's doing a lot of work in this area um, is Vanderbilt. So there's a woman named Julie Lowndes Taylor who's done quite a bit of research on just understanding the challenges that adults with autism face. And now they've developed a few different intervention um, strategies and other, um, other programs to support adults. Thanks for following. There's a, a comment, and I guess it's along the lines of what you just talked about. Um, Dee has asked, what about young adult women diagnosed with Asperger's as adults? Because of their intelligence and age, they have no support, or even those who even believe their diagnosis, their lives are passing by. You want to make a comment to that? Yes. And actually, I'll say that when I said that the, you know, one of the most underrepresented groups in terms of research is adults, the other one is women. And so now this D has basically put those together and you've identified the most understudied group in autism is women mm -hmm. with autism. Um, and part of the reason, there's a couple of reasons. One is that we know that the diagnostic rate is skewed towards boys or, you know, or males at four to one. That's true across neurodevelopmental disorders. And there's a lot of reasons for that. I won't get into the details. We think it's partly genetic in that that second X chromosome can sometimes be protective of certain features. Um, and uh, so that's one, but we also actually think that it's related to how girls present. So girls, especially early in childhood may have, we think we know have more what we call internalizing symptoms. They tend to be more withdrawn. They're not the ones in the schoolyard causing problems and getting into trouble, you know, on the yard. They're the ones who are really anxious and maybe not, you know, speaking up as much, but also maybe because of that are falling under the radar in terms of um, getting diagnosed. So we do think there's an actual diagnostic bias. Um, but in general, we know the rate is, is smaller. And so what happens in our research studies and in our programs is that where our studies are very biased towards males because there's just less, we're seeing less women. 
Um, and so, you know, there's one um, really important initiative that we're actually a part of at UCLA called, the, the name of the study is GENDAR, G-E-N-D-A-A-R. It's a very long acronym that I can't even remember what all the letters stand for, but it's basically a study trying to understand both the clinical features and actually brain-based biomarkers that distinguish girls from boys with autism. And it's really focused on um, adolescent. It, it was initially school age and adolescents, and then the new one is actually now following these girls into early adulthood. And so we'll learn a lot more there around what are the specific challenges and even clinical features that we are finding in girls with autism or you know, what used to be called Asperger's, which is um, individuals with autism who have you know, relatively intact normal language and IQs. Um, but I, I completely agree with you. You know, the comment about they don't have supports, people don't believe their diagnosis, um, that is absolutely a challenge, especially when, you know, they're not um, as affected from the standpoint of maybe having, again, intellectual disability and other, other challenges. Um, sometimes they get misdiagnosed or missed. Um, I, there was another question that I do want to address in here actually around if 20, 15 to 20% of cases are due to genetics, what about the other causes? It's a great question and it's kind of a nuanced answer. So I didn't want to get into it too much because I think the genetic story, um, you know, is sort of reflective of kind of where we are in precision health, but it actually applies to the other 80% too. So we think actually genetics is implicated across the board. But in, in the other cases, what we think is going on is that it's what we call polygenic risk. And this is true in many neuropsychiatric conditions. So what is polygenic risk? Well, we all have a lot of common variants in our DNA, right? Like things that we inherited from mom and dad that alone don't cause any symptoms, right? All our polygen, you know, all the different genes in our bodies explain why we have the color hair we do or why we have certain even personality features or, you know, whatever else that defines who we are. Um, there's all these common variants that we have in our DNA. We think that in some, you know, in, in the large proportion of indi individuals with neurodevelopmental disorders, that the recipe of whatever common variants they inherited from mom and dad taken together actually do cause developmental delays or autism. So it's not one gene, it's just that combination of all the different variations. So you might ask, well, how do you detect that? How do you diagnose this? And then you really can't to really to you know really examine and quantify polygenic risk you need studies with a massive massive number of individuals like thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands and that's actually been hard to do actually thus far in autism but there's a lot of interest and in, now all of our studies across the board include a genetics component like most of our studies that are funded by NIH I don't mean ours like mine I mean in the autism research community we're collecting biosamples so we can start creating these polygenic risk scores to figure out you know what is the threshold above which oh this person is more likely to have autism um, so it's still, you know, genetic, but not a single gene. Why is that important? Well, we still think that that polygenic risk taken together is still impacting brain development similarly to how we might see it affected in these single gene disorders. Maybe not as severely, maybe not exactly in the same way, but those basic pathways are the same. And again, I always talk about the pathways because the pathways are what we are targeting, you know, with various treatments. But it's a great, great question about the other 80%. Speaking of pathway, Shivali, the comment here, the question, could you comment on the potential for downstream pathways for some of the genetic syndromes overlapping with the biology in some patients with unknown cause? Potential Absolutely. And this is yeah. Dr. Beversdorf, who's also a big leader in autism research, asking that question. So it's a it's a great one. And he probably has specific thoughts on this. But the answer is, yeah, I mean, there's absolutely. So when I think of precision health, and I have a slide on this when I give, you know, actual formal presentations, I always talk about it as, you know, it's what is the right treatment, right? So yeah, it could be a, a gene editing or a gene target, genetic targeting treatment, or it could be a mechanism specific treatment. So what are the examples there? Well, it could be targeting, again, brain circuit function through neuromodulation or other strategies. But we also know that those circuits are affected by certain neurohormones or neurotransmitters, like what we consider inhibitory or excitatory neurotransmission, like GABA and glutamate. We know that other neurohormones like oxytocin are implicated in certain, you know, certain pathways in autism. And so, and we have drugs that are used for other conditions that can be repurposed 
to target some of these common pathways. Um, and so that's the good news. Now the question then becomes though, but how do you know who should get which drug? And we're not there yet, right? And that's where a lot of our research in figuring out, you know, are there specific biomarkers that reflect pathways? Can we measure those robustly in individuals, especially early in development, right? Like that's, those are some of the questions we're now starting to ask. Now that we know that there's a, there are possibilities for therapeutics. Um, and so, yeah, so that's a, it's a great question. So there are absolutely, our goal is that we'll have mechanism driven treatments that aren't just specific to one genetic cause. Another question here, is there evidence of low gestational progesterone contributing to autism? That's an interesting question. So not specifically progesterone. I would say there is an interest there. So um, Simon Baron Cohen, who is a researcher in um, at, in Cambridge University, has you know has had this sort of theory about autism being um, um, possibly in a subset of folks at least um, caused by or at least one of the contributions is that there's kind of more testosterone um, in the fetal exposure in the fetal brain, um, and they've been just starting to do some studies. He actually just got a big grant to kind of study this. Um, to kind of understand this, because you know, again, it's sort of a stereotype, but there is sort of this theory that some that he's actually proposed that in some cases of autism, it's almost like an extreme male brain, so more categorical, less, you know, having less sort of um, natural social skills, less empathy, um, which is not to say that that men don't have those skills, but that the you know he proposes that this sort of extreme male brain, where there's again, you're more systematizing and um, uh, those sort of features may be um, found because there may be some differences in fetal brain exposure to testosterone. So that has not been proven, but it's definitely an interesting theory that is being tested. And I'll say it kind of more broadly, I think it sort of led us to think about, well, can we, how can we assay or better understand these changes even as early as fetal development, right? So how do we study you know, the environment of the fetus, the, the neurohormone environment, the genetics, right? To, so that we can figure out what are the different pathways that lead to this, you know, this autism diagnosis. Shivali, there's a move, as you know, to have patients involved at every level of research now, patient-centered research with, you know, inter with patient involvement being integral. So the question here is, do you have any actually autistic adults advising your research? Yes, it's a great question. And actually the International Society for Autism Research um, um, on whose board I sat a, few, a couple of years ago um, made it a very um, sort of key central point um, and area of priority that autistic adults were involved with the entire, um, our entire research agenda. Um, not just that they were, they, so not only were autistic adults involved with planning the meeting and joining in in the meeting, but also thinking about what would be the priorities for panels that are being presented or discussed. Um, so yes, absolutely. I think that's also, we've seen it occur also from the standpoint of funding priorities. There are certain um, funding organizations that include advocates, and I don't mean just autistic adults, but also parents of children with autism. Um, mm -hmm. In the genetic syndrome world, you know, these groups uh, form patient advocacy groups, and we have representatives of patient advocacy groups. So they, so all those constituents are actually now often in certain funding organizations involved with the review of research proposals, so that they can help us determine how relevant is this to our families, right? So, cause we, you know, we as clinicians and scientists can decide what we think is important, but if it's not relevant to our families or to our um, self advocates or to any of the advocacy community, then it becomes, you know, probably less of a priority than it could have been. Um, so that there's been a huge movement there. And I think again, going back to this idea of the PAGs or the patient advocacy groups, you know, there's been an explosion in these PAGs over the last decade as we've identified various genetic causes. So every time a new genetic cause is found, um, what patients do, what families do, which is one of the beauties of technology is that they get on the internet and they get onto Facebook and they get to, they get onto social media and they ask, hey, I just, my, my child just got diagnosed with X, Y, and Z. Anyone else out there have a child with the same diagnosis? And they often will find other families 
before we as clinicians have seen another child with the same condition. And then they'll come back to us and say, they'll come back to me and say, hey, I have 10 families now that I know that have exactly what my daughter has. And here's some things that we've all found. You know, we've noticed that there are certain patterns. We've noticed there's some treatments that work really well. We've noticed that, you know, sleep is a big issue and it turns out melatonin works really well, whatever it might be. And, you know, that helps us. I actually, I listen to that. I really, really find that valuable. And, you know, those kinds of groups then form patient registries. They get funding to perform natural history studies. And frankly, they're the ones who are actually accelerating a lot of this landscape and from the standpoint of clinical trials. Uh, I, you know, I can tell you a story of an Angelman syndrome, for instance, which is one genetic condition that's highly penetrant for developmental delay in autism and epilepsy. It was, it was really one parent advocate who worked with a patient advocacy group to fundraise and work with scientists to, um, who were already thinking about a therapeutic. Um, they worked together and they basically funded a small biotech company to implement a clinical trial for a specific disease modifying therapy for Angelman. And now we have a trial and it, and it was, you know, start to finish. It was the parent advocates who like accelerated this process. It would not have happened that fast without our parents. It's incredible. Yeah. It's an incredible story. <laughs> Question here. Why does the U S medical community not recognize PDA or demand avoidant profile? Uh, P, I, I don't know what PDA is. Sorry if I'm uh, missing I, that. Um, yeah, I'm not sure either. How does it demand avoidance? Yeah, I don't. Um, I, I don't want to answer the question incorrectly. Um, if it's a, it's, if it's a kind of behavioral intervention, I can sort of take a, give a broader answer to that, which is. You know, the, and I didn't mention this in my talks, I focus so much on precision health, but as I kind of mentioned in the beginning, you know, the gold standard therapy for autism once we make a diagnosis is behavioral intervention. But, you know, behavioral intervention is not behavioral intervention is not behavioral intervention, right? I mean, there's so many different kinds available. And we don't actually endorse one specific kind. Many of our interventions fall under this umbrella that we call ABA, Applied Behavior Analysis. An ABA really just really means any kind of intervention that's trying to modify a behavior. So there's all kinds of different forms of ABA, uh, but that's what we recommend, but it really ends up depending on what's available to a child or a family in their community, You know what they can access, what they might be interested in based on what their friends are trying or what they've found to be successful. So it's not really all that evidence-based, unfortunately, although there's attempts to do more you know, evidence-based trials and behavioral intervention. So as a medical community, we try to be careful about not, you know, over endorsing or under endorsing a specific behavioral intervention. What we try to do is suggest that a child receive enough supports, you know, have a school setting that is supportive of their, of the child's needs and that the, that the, you know, child or adult get the behavioral interventions that they would need, which I know sounds really vague and fluffy, but unfortunately that's kind of all we can recommend. Um, and so we try our best to advocate for our families, but we try not to endorse a specific, um, a specific type of behavioral intervention. Any recommendations, Shefali, on new research on supplements for autism? New supplements. So uh, no, in the sense that there aren't any that have been tested in clinical trials to be specifically effective, unless we consider melatonin a supplement. So melatonin, so sleep insomnia and sleep issues are the number one co-occurring condition in autism. 80% of individuals with autism suffer from insomnia. And the classic profile is that, a, a, and I'm gonna say child because I mostly take care of kids, but this actually applies across a lifetime. The <clears> typical <throat> profile is a child will have difficulty falling asleep and then have multiple nighttime awakenings. So we call it fragmented sleep. Uh, and melatonin has been shown in multiple clinical trials to be effective, particularly for sleep onset, so helping kids fall asleep. And we don't know if, it's be, if it really reflects the fact that melatonin, which is a, a neurotransmitter that your body naturally produces, to tell your body, hey, it's time to go to bed. So when we see dark you know, coming in and we stop looking at our screens and everything else, we have a surge of melatonin in our brain and we get sleepy and we go to sleep. Um, and then orexin, which is another set of hormones, sort of tells us that it's time to wake up. I'm oversimplifying it if there's sleep folks on this 
call, I'm sorry to oversimplify, but that's kind of the basic biology. And so, you know, melatonin is a, is a supplement that we can take to help our brains know, hey, it's now time to go to sleep. And we think that in some individuals with autism, maybe melatonin is not being produced enough or the melatonin receptors aren't working quite as well. There may be some genetic changes that are affecting melatonin production or its effectiveness. And so melatonin has been shown to be very effective and it's over the counter. So I, I actually recommend it for my patients all the time um, as, a, um, as a way to help normalize and regulate their sleep cycle. Um, but, uh, but supplements for kind of the core symptoms or signs of autism, meaning for social skills or repetitive behaviors or restricted interests or sensory issues, we really don't have any evidence-based supplements. Um, you know, bigger picture, I would say my, my answer to, because I always, so there's two things. One is when I see a patient in clinic and I tell all my trainees this too, it's really important. And for those of you who are parents or even providers, I think it's an important reminder for all of us is that, you know, it's really important for your provider to know every supplement you're taking. Don't be ashamed, don't hide it because we need to know because some of the, first of all, more than 50% of patients are taking a supplement that's been shown in the literature to be the case, but we often don't ask. And the reason that's a problem is that some of the supplements could interact with some of the drugs we're actually prescribing, you know, like GABA or even, you know, oxytocin and things like that. And so it's important for us to know, not because we're going to judge or we're going to criticize, but because it helps us take better safe care of our patients. So I, you know, when I ask about medications, what I ask is what are you taking that's prescribed? And then what else are you actually putting in your child's mouth? What else is being taken every day? And then that helps me get a good picture of what's being taken. And my general, I'm generally supportive of supplements. The only time I'm not is if I think it's actually dangerous. If it's something that I think is actually harmful. And I'll be honest, harmful doesn't just mean medically harmful. I find harm also in cost. And so if I find that a family of mine is spending so much money and resource and sacrificing so many other things to pay for some supplement that someone told them was going to cure their child's autism, you know, I, I have a conversation with my, you know, with my family about that to just sort of help them understand that, you know, it might be helpful, but we don't have evidence yet. And so maybe those funds are, could be used in other ways, like for more behavioral intervention or other supports. So I think it's an important dialogue to have, you know, with your provider, for sure, if you're a, if you're a parent. Shafali, do you have studies or research um, on risk of an autistic adult having an autistic baby? This person says, Laura says, my daughter and grandson could be in that study. It's a great question. Yeah, so the, we know that the rates are higher if there's a, a parent with autism. Um, and it's probably, so it, it depends a bit on what the underlying cause in the parent is. So if a parent has an autism diagnosis because they have a genetic cause that happens to be a new mutation, meaning it wasn't passed down from their parent, it was brand new in them, right? Then the likelihood that they're gonna pass that down. So they're the first in their family to have it, but the likelihood that they're gonna pass that down to their child is actually 50-50, right? So the chance of that child actually having some developmental disability is pretty high. If the autism in the parent is due to what we're calling kind of polygenic risk, right? And so they have like a mix of a bunch of different genes, then it, it'll depend a little bit on the, the other parent, right? And what kind of genes they're bringing to the table. So we don't, we can't, it's hard to give exact numbers, but the rates end up being kind of similar to what we see in the SIBs. So we, it's higher than the general population as a whole, but we would say it's somewhere again, around maybe 10 to 20%. Um, but there are, so we don't, our studies of the high risk infants or the higher likelihood infants are based on having an older sibling. We actually don't have studies that are studying children who have parents with autism, but it's a really interesting question. Um, and there are some centers um, and programs that are actually trying to understand that a bit better. Shafali. This, I've never, some of these words are new to me. So neurodivergent self-advocates would likely not agree with the assessment of autism as a behavioral disorder. Why do neurotypical experts get to define what's normal? Yeah, no, it's a very good question. And I think that, look, I'll put it this way. It speaks to one, the extreme heterogeneity of autism, but I think, you know, wearing, I'm wearing my clinician hat largely when I, when I talk about this, 
and you know, fully respecting the self-advocates. I was actually doing a, a, a panel this morning where this exact topic and question came up again, right? Where there's hesitancy among self-advocates around us talking about treatments. And we, I don't use the word cure ever because um, I think it has way too many challenging um, connotations. Um, but we do talk about treatments. And I'll tell you this is that when I, as a clinician, am making an autism spectrum disorder diagnosis, um, it requires that there is functional impairment, meaning that that person whom I, I'm diagnosed, be it an adult or a child or, you know, not an infant, but a child or an adult, you know, has enough challenges that it's getting in the way of them, of their ability to maybe live their best life either because there's challenges at work and at school and at home, whatever those domains are. But to have a clinical diagnosis of autism spectrum disorder, you do need functional impairment. Now, again, that level of impairment, the type absolutely ranges, right? And I have, you know, most of the patients that I'm taking care of, yeah, they have profound intellectual disability in addition to an autism diagnosis. They have seizures, they have motor impairments and parents want treatments for those things, right? We want treatments to help improve their quality of life. Um, so, you know, the question that gets raised is, you know, we, there is an absolute range in our world of social skills, right? Some of us are much more socially overt and comfortable than others. Some are more introverted. There's a whole range, right? But that those are social behaviors and traits to meet clinical criteria for autism, that the social behavior has to cause functional impairment. And so that's why we talk about it as a, you know, as a condition or a disorder or, or and needing treatments, not because we're judging or not because we're saying that every aspect of an individual with autism's life needs to be fixed or treated or changed at all. You know, there's a lot of wonderful qualities that many of my patients have and my families have that we don't want to change, right? And we know that, but there's a lot of things that we do want to improve. And that's where really, what we're really trying to um, kind of understand and, um, and, and tackle with our, with our treatments. Yep. Shefali, is imaging playing a role as a diagnostic or prognostic biomarker? Great question. Um, so not as a diagnostic biomarker, um, but imaging has become, um, we're very interested in imaging both, you know, um, MRI, like meaning, which is a very detailed um, sort of picture of the brain, as well as kind of more functional neuroimaging with even, I would consider electroencephalography, which is a tool we use in my lab and many others do, is kind of a functional imaging tool. It's looking at how the brain is firing in real time. We think those tools taken together can be very helpful in us, you know, really uh, measuring those changes in brain development that I described earlier. And in fact, there's a large consortium study called the Infant Brain Imaging Study, IBIS, of which we are a part, um, that's using both EEG and imaging to study infants as early as six months of age um, to ask, are there imaging features that help us at least stratify babies better to say, hey, you know, based on these features and these differences in brain networks, this infant might be at 50% likelihood of, of, you know, having an autism diagnosis later. And those kinds of strategies can, again, really help us start to monitor infants earlier and maybe even start interventions earlier. You know, I always get asked, like, will EEG or imaging be used in the clinic, right, as a, like a tool? And I think realistically, probably not as a diagnostic tool, because again, fundamentally, these are diagnoses based on behaviors and we're not, that's not going to change. Now, could we be at a point where something like EEG, which is much cheaper and pretty accessible and scalable, could we use EEG in certain settings uh, to help us determine, you know, uh, again, if an infant's at higher likelihood, so we're gonna follow them closer, maybe, could we use EEG to tell us, hey, this pattern is one that we think would be amenable to this kind of treatment? And we could use it in that way, very possible. So I think those are the ways we might be able to use these biomarkers as we call them, you know, these imaging or physiological tools. Um, but I think it's unlikely that we'll be using these tools to diagnose autism. Shafali, is the prevalence of autism truly rising or are we getting better at making the diagnosis? And if it's rising, why? Great question. And I'll try to be succinct on this one. It's a complicated question and answer. So uh, the prevalence is those estimates that the CDC gives, those are based on diagnoses that are already made in children up to age eight in different states. 
right? So as we become more proficient in our diagnoses and as we become more proficient in diagnosing kids earlier in childhood, right? In that age range that we're kind of capturing, our rates are going up. So it's largely due to the fact that we have more awareness about autism and we're diagnosing it more proficiently. That is absolutely um, one of the driving factors. One of the other big driving factors for the increase in prevalence is what we call diagnostic substitution. So in the educational system, unfortunately, you really get one neurodevelopmental diagnosis that drives your services. And it turns out that autism is a diagnosis that actually affords a child many more services than intellectual disability. And so what we found, and there's been many studies that have looked at this, that over the last decade or two, that the diagnosis of intellectual disability is often replaced by autism. It does not mean that the autism diagnosis is inaccurate, but it becomes the primary diagnosis. And so that, and it also drives, you know, some of these diagnostic rates that we see. So much of our, our, our increase in prevalence is based on diagnostic practices. Having said that, there are some very small factors that probably contribute, that biological factors that contribute to the increase in rate. One of the big ones, but again, it only probably accounts for like 1% of the increase is, um, meaning 1% of the total prevalence, not 1% of the population, um, is that you know, parental age is getting older. And we know that actually advanced parental age, particularly paternal age, is associated with higher rates of all neurodevelopmental disorders because there's a higher rate of genetic mutations occurring in the sperm. And so that is that does contribute to the increase in rate. But again, it's a really, really small um, contribution compared to really the contribution of our diagnostic practices. Well, I'm trying, I think we have four minutes left and I want to get, there's a couple of comments here about um, individuals with Asperger's being diagnosed later in life in, during adulthood, but making it through elite college, getting degrees, but are now stuck and cannot move ahead. You kind of addressed this, but what would your recommendation and advice be for those people? I wish I had, you know, great advice for you. I think that, you know, I let me, we can actually put it on the website maybe, but I can give you the information for that peers to careers program because on their website, I think they have links to other, you know, adult programs um, that are available. But I think what I would say is that what the story that is, um, that I think um, Dee is, is uh, articulating here is not uncommon. And um, what we try to do and what I try to do for my patients who are in that situation is we try our best to get them <clears throat> external supports. Um, and so in California, for instance, we have a regional center, which again, there's an equivalent of a regional center, which provides services for individuals um, with various you know, diagnoses. Um, there's the, there are equivalents of regional centers across the country. You know, and it, once you have a diagnosis, you are eligible for regional center services and supports for a lifetime. You know, often adults get kicked out of those services, but that's that's not that actually should not be happening. And so I always try to help my families advocate to get back into getting some services. And those include things like peer support groups, vocational training, you know, getting hooked into different job opportunities so that there's some um, enhancement of those opportunities and quality of life. Um, but it, it is a difficult, difficult question. And I wish I had a perfect answer for you, but I think it's an area of unmet need um, of which we are aware and we need to be developing better programs. The, the link to um, Peers to Careers has actually been put oh, in the actually. chat box. So I would encourage you to hit, click on that before uh, this session ends. Well, Dr. Jeste, thank you so much. Um, that was a, a fantastic session. Um, and I'm sure we could spend a lot longer because I didn't even get to ask half of my questions. So, but um, thanks <laughs> thank everybody. You for the audience questions. They were excellent, excellent questions that I'm sorry I didn't always have the perfect answer. And that just shows that we have a lot more work to do. So. Yeah, well, thank, thank you, you for everything you're doing, uh, Shafali, and thank you for joining us tonight. Thank you everybody for joining us tonight. I hope you got a lot out of this. I know I did. And uh, we'll see you during the next salon. Thanks everybody, good night.